Uh, the source sheet was just posted for those who want to access it uh, and print it out on your own. Uh, it's now in the chat box. Excellent. Thank you. So um, we're now beginning our third and final session on the family. And um, I wanted to start with a little bit of review. Um, and last week we saw that, that we had two issues of Mora and Kavod that come from the two psukim, one in Shmot, Kabed et avicha vet imecha. That's from the Aserta that he brought of Parshat Yitro. And the second, Ish imova aviv tiro, that from Parshat Kedoshim. And we last week explored mainly the issue of mora. Um, lo omed bim komo, lo yoshev bim komo, lo, lo soter dvara, lo machrio. Today, we're going to be looking more at kibud, and specifically with the issue of elderly parents. And it's important to remind before we start, what are the obligations of kibud? And we saw that they came in three pairs. Ma'achil uh, u'mashke, giving food and drink. Ma'bishu mechase, giving clothing and warmth and basically shelter. Ma'chnis u'motzi, helping them come in and come out to get to the, to the places that they need to be. And I think we can almost look at this as a kind of mirror of what happens uh, to us as parents when we have kids. These, are, these three obligations, these three areas are our first responsibility to the newborn child, um, giving them food and sustenance, giving them clothing, helping them come in and come out. And this kind of reverses itself uh, in the end of life. And um, with our parents, these obligations that they did for us come to us as children to provide for them. So I just want you to remember these, these three categories as we move into our topic for today. And so I'm gonna now move over to our source, our source sheet for today. And, and what we're gonna be doing today is looking at three stories um, that come in the same uh, tech, the same, the same place in the Talmud. And it's really interesting that these three stories come almost one after the other, presenting kind of three models of kibud, of these obligations towards an elderly parent. Um, what you're looking at on the screen now is something which I work with a lot in everything that I do in Talmud, and that is looking at the different versions as I've mentioned to you before, but here specifically, we have um, Geniza fragments. And to remind you, uh, if you don't know so much about Geniza fragments, these are mainly were discovered in, the, in Cairo, in a synagogue in Cairo at the end of the 19th century. Um, and the person who was the main person with Geniza fragments was Solomon Schechter. Solomon Schechter pictured here in his study in Cambridge um, on return from Cairo with boxes and boxes and boxes full of fragments is looking over his finds. And basically since then, we still haven't really mastered this huge amount of material. And this, this, the, the, this specific picture that you're seeing here is really a number of different fragments that came in this collection. Now, it, it, you can see that they've been fit together like a puzzle. And this, this main fragment that I'm pointing out here 
This is a totally different number than the fragment over here on the right. And it was only after a lot of time that someone found the puzzle piece that fits right in here. And so this fits together, completing the text that we, we didn't have on the right side. And we also get a textual note. And this is all with the text that we're gonna be learning today um, with the three stories that I mentioned. So uh, we'll come back to this fragment later, um, but let's start right away with the stories. And I, I'm calling them story number one, story number two, and story number three for the purposes of clarity, even though that, like I said, they come almost one after the other in the Talmud. And the other thing is I've also put on the source sheet um, some parallel sources. And then at the end, we're gonna do what we've done in the last uh, couple of weeks. We're gonna look at the post game, the major um, deciders of halakha, the responsa on this issue and see what they have to add. So we're gonna start with, a, with the story of Rabbi Abahu, but before that, that what kind of gets the whole thing started is the following tradition that was taught by Avimi Berei de Rabbi Abahu. Avimi Berei de Rabbi Abahu taught the following. Yesh ma'achil aviv fisyone v'tor domino olam, v'yesh matchino berei chayim u'meviyo l'chaye olam abba. So there are children who provide for their father, but here you can say for their parents. Um, the most luxurious of meals, pheasant. And this takes them from this world, literally brings upon them punishment. And there are those children who make their parents work hard at the millstone. And this brings the, the children into the world to come. Th this source is not elaborated on in the Bavli, in, in our in our sugya, it's it's actually explained in a parallel sugya in the Talmud Yerushalmi, and if we have time later, I'll show you that source. But basically, what the Yerushalmi says is that you can provide for your parents an amazing luxury, but your attitude towards them could bring upon you punishment. Meaning, yeah, you're giving them the physical comfort, but you're being completely disrespectful and mean to your parent, and that would bring upon you punishment. And on the other hand, you could actually ask your parent to do hard work, and that can bring you in to the world to come. Um, the, the Yerushalmi illustrates this with two different stories about basically the attitudes of children towards parents. And in the second story, how would a child be rewarded for making their parent work hard at the millstone? The Rushalmi says, this is a story of a person who worked as a miller and the government decree came that all the millers had to go into government service and work for the emperor. And so this miller said to his elderly father, I want you to work at the millstone because if someone is gonna be embarrassed and abused by the government, it should be me. If someone is gonna get lashes from the government, from the emperor, from the soldiers, it should be me and not you. And therefore you take, you take over the millstone here at the home shop and I have to go out and work for the government. So that's, that's a child looking over the interests of their elderly parent. And that is seen as something that would bring the, the child to Chaye Olam even though they're putting on their parent hard work. That brings us into the first story, the story of Rabbi Abahu. And I, I love this story because it's so simple, but, and yet um, it has so much in it. Rabbi Abahu says the following. Who, what's an example of this kind of treatment? Kegon avimi bari. It's like avimi, my son, kiem mitzvat kibud. He 
um, does the mitzvah of honor. Chamisha b'nei samchei havalei la'avimi b'chayi avi. So avimi, a uh, rabbi from Babel, from Babylonia, he had five sons who were all ordained and grown up and helped around the house, you could say. Okay, so he has five of them. And yet, and in the, in the lifetime of his father, Rabbi Abahu. So just imagine we have Rabbi Abahu, the grandfather, Avimi, the son, and then the five ordained grandchildren. Viki hava ata Rabbi Abahu kari abava, and when Rabbi Abahu would come and call upon the door, literally knock on the door, Rahit Vazil Upatachle. So the one who would run and open the door was Avimi. In other words, Avimi didn't say to his kids, go and open the, the door for your grandfather. He himself would go running to the door to open for his father. And not only that, as he ran to the door, he would say, In in. He would say, yes, yes, I'm coming until he arrived at the door. So we see here on the part of Avimi, a, like it's, it's an everyday situation. And, and if we think about what it is like sometimes to knock on the door of our children or you know, our family, when we're not, we're not, we didn't tell them we were coming, there's a little, you're a little nervous. Do they really want us to come? Do they don't want us to come? And Avimi went out of his way to make his father feel invited and happy that, um, that he was knocking on the door. And therefore, as he went, he said, in, in, I'm coming, I'm coming. Yom Echad, so it happened one day, Amarle Ashkian Maya. It happened one day that Rabbi Abau said to Avimi, I'm thirsty, can you get me some water? So it's not like it is today. You don't go over to the tap and take out some water or from your refrigerator. You have to go down to the well. You have to, it could be a walk. And so um, Avimi went out to get his father water. And once again, he doesn't put that mitzvah on his children. He doesn't ask one of his children to go do it. He doesn't say, go get water for your saba. Um, Ad Aitele, until um, Avimi returned with the water, Nimne, Rabbi Abau had fallen asleep. So you, here you might be tempted that, that Avimi would wake up his father and say, here's the water. But no. Gachin Kai Ale Ad Itar. He basically bent over his father, waiting with the water until he woke up. He didn't wake up his father, he waited patiently with the water, waking, waiting for him to wake up. Istaya milte, so it worked out, the, he, he had the good fortune that while he was holding the water and waiting for his father to wake up, Darash Avimi Mizmor Asaf. Avimi was able to come into a homolytic insight into Mizmor La'asaf. Now, the, the Rashi, this whole Perush and Rashi here is, what was his insight into Mizmor La'asaf? And I would say the more complicated question is, which Mizmor La'asaf are we talking about? So there are different kinds of Mizmor, there's different kinds of poetry in Sefer Tehilim. One of the types is called Mizmor La'asaf, a, a song to Asaf. And um, so we don't exactly know what Asaf is, it's probably a name, but there are a number of Mizmorim that have that uh, title on them. So I, I have two here below, and then I have a list that you can look at in your spare time, um, which is Psalm 50, Psalm 73, 75, and 76. But 
the one that Rashi believes is being spoken about is Mizmor Asaf Elohim Ba'u Goyim Benachalatecha Tim'u et Heichal Kodshecha Samu et Yerushalayim Li'iyim. So this is a Mizmor about the destruction of the, of the temple. And therefore Rashi says, why does it say Mizmor Asaf? It should say kinal it's, asaf. It's, 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 it's not a mizmor, it's not a song. It's a, a sad dirge for that, that really. And Rashi says that the insight that Avimi came to was that God took out his anger on the stones of the temple instead of on the people. And therefore, um, there's actually, this is a mizmor in the sense that it could have been worse. The, the, it was a physical destruction of the temple, but not a destruction of the people, and the people survived. So I'm not sure that that's, I mean, it's interesting that that interpretation, if we look above, that's what's written in the margin here on this piece that, uh, like a puzzle fit in, that is what's written here. And I'm not gonna go and read every word, but you'll, you'll believe me that that's, a little, that's basically uh, similar to Rashi's commentary. So um, that's more, that's, that, that's not really related to the issue of kibu that I'm interested in at the moment. The idea is, is that Ravi, Avimi was immediately rewarded in his patience for his father that he had this insight and that he, that he, while he was waiting, he took advantage of the time and thought carefully. Um, but I think this story is nice in that we, we see um, kind of the dedication of Avimi the kind of everyday dedication. In other words, it's not, we're not, we don't have a story about, um, you know, in the middle of the night, he, he went five miles to his father's house to, to call the doctors. And no, we, we have an everyday service that Avimi is doing and a patience that he has for his father. And I, I think kind of an ideal of, of what, um, what kibbutz is. And I think something that I think is very relevant to, um, I would say, my generation as, as, a, as someone who grew up with grandparents and then with parents, is that a lot of times there is a temptation on the part of the parents to put the obligation of taking care of grandparents on their own children, in other words, the grandchildren. Um, and, and I think we see in this story a statement, of, you know, this is very clear that, 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 that Avimi took on this obligation on his own without pushing it on his children. So very quickly, is there anyone who wants to ask anything about this one before we move on to the second story? Okay, so the second story we're going to see, these stories are going to get more intense. We're basically starting with, I would say, ideal. This is an ideal situation. Rabbi Abau is happy. Rabbi Abau says, my son Avimi is, is the example. And Avimi is an example of patience. Let's see about the next story. The next story is about Rabbi Tarfon. So Rabbi Tarfon Havale Hahi'ima. Rabbi, Rabbi Tarfon had a certain mother. I added in in my translation, elderly mother. There are certain versions of the Talmud that actually read that. And I think that that's implied. De kol emat de hava baya le mesak le poraya, gachin vesalikla. Ve kol emat de hava nachit, nachtat ilave. So, Every time that she wanted to get into bed, Rabbi Tarfon had to lean down. She stepped on his back and, you know, it hurt every time. It was a pain, it was a schlep, 
She pushed on his, she stepped on his back and she got up onto the bed. Now, in, in Talmudic times, beds were probably elevated because they needed more space. So it was kind of like the, the bed with a desk under it. So the, the, the bed is elevated so that you can use the space below. So he, Rabbi Tarfon was, he, he, the, his mother stepped on him to get into bed. And then when she wanted to get out of bed, every time she wanted to get out of bed, Rabbi Tarfon had to come and she stepped on him to get out of bed. And, and obviously a lot of times she stepped exactly on his neck, right? Or, or scraped his face. And this is re real kind of dirty dedication to his mother that, 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 that he feels, Rabbi Tarfon felt, a pretty high personal price for. Ata v'kamishtabeach be'midrasha. So therefore, Rabbi Tarfon went and bragged in the study hall about what a great job he does of doing kavod. He goes in there and he says, guys, I am the best. I am the best. Now, this doesn't seem so the, the right thing for a rabbi to do, to go and brag. And it seems uncharacteristic of Rabbi Tarfon, who we know in, in other situations um, is described as being quite humble. But again, if I'm looking at this from um, a study perspective, these stories were created long, long after these people lived. Rabbi Tarfon was a Tana. He lived in the second century. This story is much later. Um, in any case, Rabbi Tarfon is depicted as going and bragging in the Beit Midrash about how great a job he does with Kibbut uh, M. And the rabbis are not impressed. The rabbis say to him, Amre le, adain lo higata lechatsi kibbut. You haven't even gotten to half what uh, could be done with kibbut horim. Klum zarka arneke b'fanecha leyam. Has she ever thrown her wallet or your wallet into the water and you didn't embarrass her? In other words, has she ever done something that was just so illogical and wild and you had to have patience and not get upset with her? Okay, so you help her get into bed and you help her get out of bed. Big deal. That's your obligation. That's part of machnisu motzi, right? That's the third category that we saw in kibbutz, and um, that's that's your obligation, Rabbi Tarfon. You're not doing any more than your obligation. So um, I would say in this story, we have we have a mother who seems we don't we don't hear her voice in this story, but she doesn't seem she seems to kind of take this for granted. And Rabbi Tarfon, maybe because she does take it for granted, feels the need to go and brag about it. Um, and so, so we, we, we're starting to see here, I would say a less kind of healthy uh, atmosphere that we saw in the previous story, an appreciation on both sides. Um, here we see something a little different. And, and we also have the note of the rabbis, which I think is kind of a statement of how difficult this mitzvah is, is that, you know, you, even though you're, so, that you're, you're dedicated to that extent, you haven't even gotten to half of what kibbud uh, of the end could be. Yes, Carol, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I just wanna make a few comments. One is that I noticed both stories have gachin, that they bent over, which I'm wondering if that appears a lot, but also it's interesting. And the first one, I think he, th this is even more um, submissive or because he's actually bending over and she's stepping on him. Whereas the other one, he's bending over and like waiting. But I just thought right. it was interesting. They both, both use that language. And also um, in this one, also the aspect of that it seems to be in public. I mean, it's possible nobody else is in the sea, at the sea, 
But you know, the, the thing that he does is a very private thing, which as you said, is why possibly he feels a need to brag about it. Whereas the examples the rabbis are giving are a very public like humiliation, not just of his, that he could feel in front of other people, plus he's losing his money. Like it's not just, right. he's bending over for a minute. <laughs> But I thought, right. you know, that contrast was, you know, before Hesia kind of in public. Yeah, no, also- those are both those are both very good points. And um, first of all, the issue of Gachin, um, yes, I don't. I think that that is definitely intentional. And there's a tendency that when we have material in the Talmud, which is next to each other, that there's 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 kind of words that repeat themselves and appear in this, the, the same context over and over again. Gachin is not, it, it's a pretty common word, but it's not all the time. It's, you don't find it on every page of Talmud. So I think that you're, you're seeing something here that's intentional on the part of the editors of the story. And, and these stories I think are meant to kind of be compared, contrasted, they're bringing out different elements um, and teaching in different way, teaching through example. Um, and yeah, I think that that uh, Avimi basically took his time of Gachin and tried to get the most out of it. Whereas Rabbi Tarfon we see is, seems to be kind of uh, uh, not happy about it, but if we have time, I'll show you the story in the Yerushalmi, which is completely different than this one. They're, they're definitely come from the same source. And the Yerushalmi has a very different picture of Rabbi Tarfum, much more positive than this one. So, but, but since we're talking about the stories as they're edited in the Bavli, and that's what I'm doing right now, I'm going to leave that aside for, for the time being. You're definitely right about the issue of Farhesia. And so the idea that a child that a that a parent embarrasses the child in public is seen in the Bavli as the ultimate test of um, kibbut. That's the ultimate test. And there's another example given of um, a certain child who was sitting among the elders and the parent came up or the mother came and hit him with her sandal in front of everyone and so yeah that's really public humiliation so um and and then there's also the issue of whose wallet is this whose money is that this that's being thrown into the sea and there's debate in the talmud and basically either way it requires patience on the part of the child if it's the child's money, so that's simple. But it also could be the parent's money. And then the Talmud says that it's an issue of taking away from the inheritance. So that's the Rabbi Tarfon story. The most involved and difficult story is story number three. Story number three, um, I, I, I we could literally talk about this story for two hours and th- there's so many things that are not completely clear in this story that um, there's a lot here. Um, but basically this story, the story of Rav Asi becomes the main story for treating elderly parents. And I- I'll explain why as we move on and created huge debate among later uh, commentators and deciders of halakha. So um, let's look at the Rav Asi story. Rav Asi havalei hahi imaskena. So Rav Asi had an elderly mother. Amrale, his elderly mother said to him, ba'ina takshitin, I want jewelry. Avadla, he made for her Jewelry. Baina Gavra, she said, I want a man. So uh, Ravasi says, Na'ayenlach, okay, I'll look for a man for you. 
So then she says, Ba'ina gavra de Shapir Kavate. I want a man who is uh, handsome like you are, Rav Asi. So this was too much to take. Um, that's my addition, but it says, Shabka Vazala Arad Israel. He left, he literally, he left, he went to the land of Israel. Now, oftentimes in the Talmud, we have things in, in threes. So we have Ba'ina Tafshitin, I want jewelry. Ba'ina Gavra, I want a man. Ba'ina Gavra de Shapir Kavatech, I want a man as handsome as you. So that basically is transmitting constant demands, right? This, this elderly mother of Ravasi was a pain. She was always asking for things. And Ravasi had patience to a point. And it seems that the point of which it, he couldn't take it anymore was when it became abnormal. Um, in, in, you could almost look at this as um, a kind of gilui arayot, right? It's, um, it's, you know, she, she, she likes her son and, or at least hints at that. I mean, um, but that is the point where Ravasi said, I can't take this anymore. And how does he deal with it? He goes and makes Aliyah. Um, and if we look, I'm going to look back for a second at the Geniza fragment that I showed you. And I want to show you something interesting. You can see the blue arrow, arrow which is exactly pointing at this point in the story. She, she said, Ba'ina Gavra uh, Shapir Kavatech. Okay, that's what it says here. Ba'ina Gavra Shapir Kavatech. And it says here, Arak. Okay, it doesn't say, it doesn't say um, what it says in the printed and the other versions. It says Arak. Arak in, in Aramaic means he ran away. Okay, so that's a stronger, much stronger description than we have in the story in the other versions in which we say Shavka. Okay, so, so sometimes when we look at the different, the different versions, we can, it really can make a difference in how we, we interpret the story. And this point in the story, we will see later, is very important for the poskim, for the, for the deciders of halakha. So um, he, Ravasi, either ran away, Iraq, or Ravasi left Shav, Shavaka, he, he left her and went to the land of Israel. Now, I, if uh, I'm assuming that Arak la'ara di Israel, right? That's what it said in the Geniza fragment, but we don't have that part. That puzzle piece is missing. And that often happens with Geniza fragments that the part that you, you're interested in is missing. But I think we, we got enough from what we saw there. So the story is not over. Shama deka azla abatre. Ravasi got to Eretz Israel, and he hears that his mother is coming after him. Oi. Ata lekame de Rabbi Yochanan. He came in front of Rabbi Yochanan. Amarle, mahu latzet mi Eretz mi Eretz lechutz laaretz. What is the rule regarding? basically leaving Eretz Israel and going to Chutz Laaretz. Now, why does Rav Asi want to go to Chutz Laaretz? If his mother is coming, it, it seems, it seems on first glance, why does he want to go? Why does he want to leave? Escape his mother. Exactly. He wants to escape his mother. She's coming here. I'm going there. The whole reason he came to Israel was to get away from her. Now she's coming after him. He wants to go back there. 
So he comes to Rabbi Yochanan and asks him if he can leave the land of Israel. Amar le asur. Rabbi Yochanan said, no, you can't leave the land of Israel. Likrat ima mahu. Ah, but now, what kind of, how are we going to understand likrat? In other words, are we going to understand likrat as in order to do the mitzvah of honoring my mother, may I leave? Which, which you could understand in a positive sense. Or is it, I want to get away from my mother. His, by using the, the, the word likrat and not likvod, right? He could have said likvod ima. Then that would have been surely positive. But he says likrat ima. Because of the mother, what would be the rule? And Rabbi Yochanan says to him, eni yodea. I don't know. I, lo I love that answer. I don't know. Like, um, Rabbi, the great Rabbi Yochanan, I don't know. So Rav Asi evidently didn't leave Rabbi Yochanan alone. Itrach purta. He waited a while. Hadar ata. In other words, it seems that Rav Asi kept pacing around and coming back and and just wouldn't leave Rabbi Yochanan alone on this issue until finally Rabbi Yochanan said to him, Amarle, Asi, He said to him, Asi, you want to leave? So may God bring you back in peace. There's also different interpretations of what he means by this. Does that mean that may God bring you back to Bavel, where you will stay in peace? Or does he mean you can go out, but may God bring you back to the land of Israel in peace? There are different interpretations. In any case, Ravasi still was not happy with this exchange. And he, because he basically, we see again that he, he was really pushing Rabbi Yochanan. First, he's asking about leaving. He got Asur, you can't. Then he changes the question, and he gets a, I don't know. Then he keeps bothering and pacing around and coming back. And finally, he doesn't get Mutar, he, but he gets a kind of um, bracha laderek, you could, you could say. So... Atala Kame de Rabbi Elazar. He comes back um, in front of Rabbi Rav Asi goes in front of Rabbi Elazar, who is a student of Rabbi Yochanan, who knows Rabbi Yochanan well. Amarle and, and uh, Rabbi uh, Elazar says to him, uh, sorry, Rabbi Rav Asi says to Rabbi Elazar, Chas v'Shalom Dilma Mirtach Ratach. So. Uh, perhaps he says, uh, Rabbi Yochanan is mad at me because I was really bothering him. And just to get rid of me, he says, shalom. and maybe that wasn't a bracha at all. Maybe that was, uh, I don't know, that maybe, maybe he meant bad for me. So I'm nervous about this. Um, so, Amarle Mai Amarla. So, but Rabbi Elazar wanted to know exactly what he said. Amarle hamakom yachzir chala shalom. That may God bring you back in peace. Amarle ve'im ita de ratach lo hava mevarech lach. So Rabbi Lazar says, if he was really angry, he wouldn't have um, blessed you. So there's a little bit of a play on words in this in 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 this section because we have the we have the root ratach, which means to be angry. And we have the word, we have the root, tarach, which means to wait. Okay, so itrach means he waited, and ratach means to be angry. So there's a little bit of a, of a play on words here in, in the story, which is common, and it also caused some mix-ups. There are certain versions that, that the, the scribe copies here that Rabbi Yochanan got angry. But that kind of ruins the story. It doesn't make, make sense that Rabbi Yochanan got angry here because 
Ravasi didn't see if he was angry or not, and that's why he went to Rabbi Lazar. In any case, now he can leave. But after all this has gone on and time has passed, what do we find out? Ad dahachi vahachi, in the meantime, Shamala arona de ka'ate. Ravasi hears that his mother is not coming, but that her coffin is coming, that she is dead. And she is being brought to Eretz Yisrael for burial. And then we get the most problematic, I would say, um, we could have a long conversation about this. And I'm just going to say literally what it means. Rav Asi says, Iyade la nafke, which I think the best translation would be, if I had known, if I had known, la nafke, I would not have gone out. Now, which, which going out are we talking about? Are we talking about Rav Asi's original going out of Babylonia, of leaving Babel and coming to Eretz Yisrael? Are we talking about the going out, the whole discussion with Rabbi Yochanan and leaving Eretz Yisrael for Bavel, which going out are we talking about? And what does Rav Asi mean by that statement? I think it's clear that Rav Asi wanted to get away from his mother. That's clear. I think we understand the reasons why Rav Asi wanted to get away from his mother. And to the extent that even when he hears that she's coming, he wants to go, he doesn't want to see her. But what does he mean here? Does he, is there some kind of regret on the part of Ravasi. Is there, or is it that until the end, Ravasi says, I yade la nafke, if I would have known that she was being brought dead, I wouldn't have even started with the whole conversation of Rabbi Yochanan, and I would have just stayed here in Eretz Yisrael where I'm happy. That seems to me to be a very valid interpretation um, of like kind of keeping Ravasi where he was. On the other hand, one might come and argue that Iyade la Navke could refer to the original leaving of Babylonia. And someone could say, make the argument that there's regret on the part of Ravasi. Had I known that she was going to die, right, that she was so close to death, I would have stayed and I would have suffered through the constant nagging and terrible comments, and I would have suffered through it. But um, I didn't understand that at the time, and I'm sorry about that. So I, I think that this story is very rich in all the possibilities that it has. Um, and I think it's also rich in the issues that it's bringing out. Um, because I think with the, with the two stories before, you had, even though the, the Rabbi Tarfon story is more intense, but still, it's, it's, there's nothing that's so dramatic. This story is dramatic in the sense that Ravasi just can't do the mitzvah of kavod, and, and, it, and therefore it, it brings up the question of what does a child do when they can no longer take care of their parents for whatever, like, and for this, in this story, it was because basically you could say she'd gone crazy. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to look at, I'm going to skip over the parallel sources, which are really interesting and very, very rich as well. But I want to look at like we've done in the last few weeks, I want to look at um, what the different um, halachic works take away from this issue. And the most important one, and the one that kind of frames the whole discussion is the Rambam. The Rambam in the Mishnah Torah, in Hilchot Mamrim, says the following. He writes the following. Misha nitrafada to shel aviv o shel imo, in a case where a person's father or mother has literally gone 
I, I call it, I would I could say dementia, but I, I think completely gone crazy. So they should attempt to be compassionate with them and to be patient until basically they are, they die. But if it's impossible for them to take it because they completely and totally went crazy to the point where it's too difficult to do, so you can leave the parent and, and the child can leave, the son or daughter can leave that parent, and the child or daughter, the, the son or daughter can um, leave their care, he can leave their care with others who will do the right thing for them. And basically this, is the opening of basically um, leaving the care of elderly parents with others. Um, and I think what the Rambam is hinting at is that sometimes for the child, it's so damaging, the, that, that care, and so demanding that it's better that it's taken over by someone who can be totally dedicated to it, who can do it professionally. Um, and I think it's something that's so common in our generation. Um, you, you have uh, the, the issue of sending an, an elderly parent to a Beit Avo, to a, you know, to a place where they're taken care of in a, in a you know, personal care situation. In Israel, you have a lot of elderly parents who the, you bring in a caregiver who takes care of them all the time. Um, and um, so the, this, this is a, opened up by the Ramba. Now, it's really fascinating. Yeah, Steve, go ahead. Yeah, the, you're, you're, conflating, you're conflating two motives. One was, I can't take it, she's crazy. And the other is, she needs professional care. Are those, right. are those to be viewed as the same or as you're doing or as different? No, I mean, I think you're, you're right that those are different issues, um, but they're, uh, I, like what I'm gonna bring out in the sources below is that, that the case of Rav Asi and, and it is kind of used as a model for both by deciders of halakha on this issue because there's really so little to go on. And because you can, you can take that you can, you, can, you can come and say that the, the mitzvah of kibbutz horim is the ultimate mitzvah that cannot be compromised in any way. It's kind of like what we saw in the Rabbi Tarflam story, you haven't even reached half. And I think what we're seeing here in the Rambam is a kind of retraction, a, a, a understanding that that ne that's not necessarily true, that it, there can be a personal price, and that's one thing, and there can also be a price for the parent, and that's what I'm saying as far as a professionalism and a caregiver. There's things that a caregiver can do which a child cannot. And I think that the Rambam is, is hinting at that. Lahan higam kira'ui lahem. Uh, I think the Rambam is kind of conflating the two, even though the starting point for the Rambam is nitrafadato. And the Rambam is saying, in a normal situation, the son or daughter would bear with, would do the kibbutz and would not let someone else do it, but sometimes it becomes impossible. Um, the Ravid, Rav Avraham ben David, um, he, who wrote notes on the Rambam and often disagrees with him, disagrees with him strongly here. 
And he says, Amar Avraham, Einzo hora nechona. This is totally wrong. Im hu yelech v'yaniach lo, v'mi yitzavel l'shomro. If he leaves, then who's he going to ask to, to watch over his parent? How can, basically what, the, what he's saying is, how can he leave that to someone else? He can't, that, that's, that's, that's wrong, says the Ravid. And basically this creates kind of two schools of thought among the poskim. I would say the more people who go with the Rambam, who are more understanding and want to, you know, be lenient in about when you can leave over the mitzvah of kibbutz to others versus a more stringent approach which says, no, the, the child really has to do it themselves. And um, the Beit Yosef sides with the Rambam. And he, the, I, I said the Beit Yosef, that's Yosef Karo, who is also the author of the Kesef Mishneh, which is a commentary on the Mishnah Torah. And um, Rav Yosef Karo, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, um, he, he brings, he's really one of the first people to, to connect the story of Ravasi. He says that the story of Ravasi is the source of the Rambam. Beperek kama de kiddushin, amrinan, Ravasi havalei hai So he thinks that that's the source. And he, then he quotes what the Rambam says. And he says that what the Rambam is saying is, Eitza tova kamashmalan. The Rambam is giving good sound advice. The ain't effect shekena sa Ravasi, and there's no question that that's what Ravasi did. Ravasi clearly put his mother. He took someone to watch over his mother. Did we see that in the story? Absolutely not. We the, and and I would say according to the read, the reading of the Geniza fragment, Iraq. That that would be that. There's no way he he just got out of there. Um, so, but here we see a more apologetic idea that Ravasi left his mother in good care to you know, and then he went to Israel, and therefore the Beit Yosef Rav Yosef Karo doesn't agree with the Ravad, and he says ve'ilu haya Rabenu. If the Rambam would have invented that idea, this idea, haya hasagato hasaga, then the note of the Ravad would be legitimate. He would have a good point. But aval achar shehu motzioto mi uvda de Ravasi shekatavti ein makom lahasagato. So, since the the Rambam took this law. From the story of Ravasi, there's no place for the note of the Ravad, and uh, the the Ravavram ben David is wrong. Uh, the Rambam is correct, and you're allowed to leave your parent in the hands of others. We see um, a different attitude from Rav Shlomo Luria. Rav Shlomo Luria, in his commentary on Masechet uh, Kiddushin, Bavli Kiddushin. He, I'm gonna skip over the beginning because he goes over the Rambam and the Ravad, he goes back over the material and then he says his own opinion. I say that the note of the Ravad was correct against the Rambam. If the, the son or daughter Leaves them, who is who is who are they going to leave in charge? And it's nothing like the story of the mother of Ravasi. Desham, because in that case, there she wasn't crazy in the sense that she needed someone to watch her. Ella, she'ela shelo kehogen, that that she asked things that were not appropriate. Miroa halev, he uses the expression miroa halev. In other words, she was 
a mean, manipulative, nasty woman. And that's why Ravasi wanted to get away from her. And there, this has nothing to do with taking care of an elderly parent, says Rav Shlomo Luria. And the obligation of taking care of a parent is, in, it should be done by the child themselves, by the son or daughter, not by someone else. I think on the shot level, he's right when he says uh, this line, um, I think that's what we got from the story. It's not that she, she wasn't dangerous to, to others. She was, she was, it seems she was dangerous and toxic to Ravasi. Um, and that was the problem. So we have the Rambam, we have the Ravad, we have Rav Yosef Karo who goes with the Rambam's position that it's okay and good. And there are times that you need to leave a parent um, in the care of others. And then there's the Maharsha, the, the Rav Shlomo Luria, who is coming back towards the school of the Rava. Um, this, I could go on and give you a lot, a lot of different um, opinions. We're almost out of time. Um, I'll just say there's a very interesting um, opinion of Rav Yoshua Falk. I'm not going to read it inside, but basically uh, I wrote it here in my summary, but he also agrees with the Ravad, and he argues that the Talmudic story of Ravasi does not mention anything about Ravasi placing someone else in charge of his mother. Correct. He's absolutely right about that. Moreover, he argues that if others are able to take care of the parent, surely the child who knows the desires and wishes of their parent can provide even better care for the parent. Therefore, the son or daughter is obligated to take care of the parent. I think that's a very problematic argument. Yeah, but none of them are... Um, Steve, I couldn't hear you completely. Maybe try saying one more time. Go ahead. It's fr he's frozen. Yeah. Can you say? Are, are you hearing me? Yeah. None of, none of them are mentioning that he's really abandoned his mother, even if he, he arranged for care, which the story doesn't say he did. He didn't follow up. He didn't make sure it's going well. He simply abandoned her. And you, the Correct. picture that the story paints is her chasing him. And that's a whole level of, of non-care, if you will, that none of, that the Rambam or the Rabbad, nobody's dealing with. Correct. And, but um, you're absolutely right. So, so basically the people who are in, the other school, I would say in the Ravad school, they're basically saying that. They're saying the story of Ravasi doesn't have anything to do with what the Rambam is saying. And they're, they're saying, did the Rambam really mean? Is that his source? So I still believe that the Rambam did take that out of the story of Ravasi. I believe that that's what the Rambam intended. And I think that the Rambam was being generous in his interpretation of Ravasi. And I think he was assuming things that were there that, were, that are not there. Um, but I think he was using that as his source for, for what he wanted to say on this issue. Um, and I think that the, the people who are on the other side, um, I think they're on, in, in, like when I look at it, kind of Besechel Yashar, I think they're on the wrong side of the issue, but I think they're reading correctly the story. In other words, they're, unlike the Rambam, they're reading the story correctly. Ravasi abandoned his mother. Ravasi did not worry about someone taking care of her. And so we can't learn anything from that story and elderly parents and, and our obligations. Um, but nonetheless, 
this has become the model. The Rambam has become the model for the, kind of the first thing that we say um, in the case of elderly parents. And I just, I'll show you a, a contemporary tshuva of Arav Eliezer Waldenberg, who was, um, he died not so long ago, 2006. Um, he has a collection of chuvot that are called Tzitz Eliezer. He was a rabbi who specifically was very interested in medical issues. And he has a, a, law, a lot of chuvot about all kinds of different uh, issues that have to do with medicine, with uh, uh, ethics. Um, and he has an issue, uh, he has a chuva. Um, which is very relevant to our topic, that the, the question that he got was, is the child allowed to tie down uh, their mother who ha has dementia? And um, this can happen, like people with dementia, you know, they can just become wild. And so sometimes it's necessary to restrain them. Um, and... So this person asked uh, Rabbi uh, Wallenberg, if it is permitted, can a child tie down their parent? And so he goes into the whole issue um, from the Rambam, the Ravad, some of the same things that we've seen. And he said, Lamanu bifashtut. So he says that we have we learn that if someone sees that their father or mother really has dementia and they can't do it. The, the child just cannot take it, then there's no choice. Um, in order to basically fulfill the obligations of God, you, that the, the son or daughter has to leave them and to give over their care to others. And what he, the, the final decision that he makes is that um, it is actually a, a, a child is not allowed to restrain to tie down their parent that that's that's in he sees that as an aggressive act that a, a child cannot do and I think that that is getting at you know professional care versus um, care of a, and, and I think that basically in the Middle Ages, they weren't as aware of that as we are in modern times. But you need, according to Rabbi Waldenberg, you need a professional. And it's, it, it's actually not good. It's, it's forbidden, he says, for, you can see in the end of the tshuva, um, he says, it's, it's clear to me uh, as a halachic decision, in this case, it's forbidden for the, for the, for the son, it's forbidden for him to tie her down. Ella. He has to let her treatment be given over to others. Basically, what he's trying to say is her care should be given to professionals who know what's best in a case like this, who know the, the way that this is dealt with today. Um, that's his final decision. Um, I think what we see from the stories is that basically a, 
I, I think that th that this this issue is so complicated. There's so many different variables that the most important thing is the attitude. And that's why the whole discussion started with there's there's a son or daughter who uh, is basically punished for their attitude about kibbutz Orim, and there's a son or daughter who is rewarded. And it's not in some kind of outside idealist picture. You could see the picture of the son treating the the father or mother to this gourmet meal. And that actually, that could be the worst possible picture of, of Kavo. On the other hand, you could see a picture of a son or daughter making their parent work at the millstone and you could say, wow, that's terrible. No, it's all in understanding the world. It's all in what is, what is the attitude of the son or daughter? What are, what are they really, what's their real care? What's their, um, and again, I come back to the Rebbe Abau story as the kind of ideal. Appreciation on both ends. Um, as the, the parent appreciating what the children do, the child appreciating the opportunity of being able to do kibbutz. Um, I recently said to my brother how much I appreciate what, the, what he does for my elderly parents. And I live a long way away. I, my parents live in Denver, Colorado, and I live in Israel. And I told him how much I appreciate what he does for them. And he said to me, basically, and he, he didn't say that in a way that made me feel bad. He said, I feel that it's a, I just, it's an honor for me to be able to do it for them. And I'm not, I'm, I'm so happy that I'm doing it and I don't feel any, any, and nothing against you that you live far away. Um, and, but like when I see what he does for them, I also feel a little bad that I also, I can't be doing that for them because of the decisions that I've made. Um, so we all have our own worlds and we all have our own kind of place where we are and different personalities. Um, and I think we've seen in these sources all through these three weeks, um, different issues that have come up and I hope you've enjoyed it and uh, look forward to anyone who has any more questions or follow up or discussion. First of all, uh, I'm happy to do it now. I'm also happy if you wanna send me an email, I'll just put my email in the chat for people who may not have it that um, you should feel free to write to me um, and follow up in any way that you like. Yeah. Steve, go ahead. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I, just on behalf of, uh, of the Young Israel, uh, we want to thank you very much. I think everybody who has, uh, who has heard you so far and those that I'm sure will feel the same that when they hear you on YouTube, um, we all very much enjoyed the series. You're a, a very, very excellent teacher. Thank you. Thanks. I enjoyed it. And uh, good. So I look forward to seeing you in the future. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.